From the Alvin and Rosalie Sarachek Studio, PBS Kansas presents Kansas Week. COVID-19 creeping back into Kansas as fall approaches. Health officials want you to get the new vaccine. Also, Wichita City officials consider how to implement paid downtown parking as business owners continue to push back. But first, as enrollment declines, the Wichita School Board wants to downsize and says they need an extra $450 million to do it. We'll discuss the new master plan and the possibility of a bond issue to pay for it, right now on Kansas Week. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jared Sorello. The Wichita School Board has voted to close four more elementary schools, and that's on top of the six schools that were already closed earlier this year. This is part of a new master plan that the school board approved this week designed to cope with declining enrollment. As Cake's Jocelyn Schifferdecker explains, the cost of the plan approaches a half a billion dollars, and it may even require voters to pass a bond issue. Four more Wichita elementary schools are set to close in the next five years. Lovature, OK, Pleasant Valley and Woodland. The Board of Education unanimously approved the district's facility master plan at its meeting Tuesday night. School Board President Stan Reeser says the plan is necessary. Without a plan, then uh, all schools are in danger for future budget cuts. He says closing four schools is only a small part of the plan. This is about combining our current inventory and reducing our administrative building footprint and then also uh, honoring the high performing neighborhood schools. Research says the district will avoid $200 million in repairs in the next 10 years by having fewer buildings in operation. The master plan also calls for demolishing and rebuilding seven buildings. Adams, Black, Irving, Caldwell, McLean, Truesdale and Coleman. Research says this will give students newer buildings and better learning opportunities. The 700 foot square foot classroom no longer works for improving student outcomes. It will also put the newer buildings close to the students. This plan matches that far better than uh, what the current footprint, which was established in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. The plan is estimated to cost $450 million. The board is considering asking for a bond to pay for it, but it says it won't raise taxes. Research says the students deserve this. We haven't made a major investment in our community in our Wichita Public Schools for the last 16 years. Here to discuss this and some of the week's other big stories are Harvey County Now Managing Editor Adam Strunk, Cowley Courier Traveler Publisher and Editor David Seaton, Democrat State Senator Oletha faust Gudo, and Republican and former Wichita City Council Member Brian Fry. Thank you all for joining us. Oletha, I'll start with you. You know a little bit about taxes and property taxes. We have the Wichita School Board trying to deal with declining enrollment. They've already closed six schools this year, and now we're talking about closing even more and passing a bond issue, a half a, nearly a half a billion dollar bond issue. Do you think it's possible to get a bond issue past voters in this climate? Well, Jared, thanks for having me uh, on one of the new shows here. Uh, absolutely. Uh, we heard the school board members say that it's necessary, and uh, I know one of the schools that we heard about uh, I attended that school, so I know that our schools, some of them are deteriorating, and uh, uh, in order for our children to get a great education, we're gonna have to do something, and it's always good to let the voters vote, but my concern would be for those children that are in neighborhood schools now, uh, that we have sidewalks if they are required to walk uh, and, and adequate transportation for them. You know, I'm always a proponent for uh, if we want children to stay in school, they need to be part of it and be able to participate in after school activities. So perhaps we'll have to have more uh, after school buses, activity buses to get them to and from those activities. And so it's always good to put it to the voters, but uh, it seems like the school board members were adamant and they were all um, on the same page of voting to uh, um, address this issue. 
Brian, I'll move on to you. A former city council member, you've never been on the school board, but you know how hard it is to get people to talk about paying more taxes. I doubt you've ever received an email from someone that says, please raise my taxes. Uh, you'd be surprised. Uh, that did happen. But look, it's absolutely necessary for the school board to right size their system. I mean, the declining enrollment tells you that it doesn't make sense to continue to pour money into systems and facilities that there's not enough students for. Uh, I mean, you're seeing the growth in the suburbs now between Derby and Goddard and Mays. Mays is looking at building a third high school. Mm -hmm. They're bursting, whereas the declining enrollment on the 259 side doesn't justify having that many facilities. Uh, you know, someone who was a product of Wichita school system and Coleman Middle School is junior high then yeah. <laughs> when I went. But, you know, seeing that updated, absolutely necessary. And I think for the students to have a great learning environment, they have to have the facilities. You know, we didn't have air conditioning when I was in elementary school, and now they have it. So mm. updating the facilities is necessary, but you have to be responsible and right-size it to accommodate the enrollment you have. And so I'm, I'm glad the school district is doing that. Yeah. David Seaton, I'll move on to you. Is the, is the environment similar in, in Cowley County, and uh, how are schools doing down there? Well, the, uh, one of our bigger districts does have declining enrollment, and they're struggling with the, uh, how to format that enrollment around the buildings around that enrollment um, they've tried to close one of the country schools for years but the uh, public fights back and boy they can't uh, the loyalty to that school it's tough there was a big bond issue not long ago that uh, did a lot of things including building a new stadium it failed miserably um, but they came back with a smaller one that passed but uh, you know school school districts are pretty savvy about these they're casting it as not a tax increase it's just continuing the mm -hmm. previous tax levy for the previous right. bond and they'll probably do like a vote a mail vote off election you know standalone vote where yep. only the support mostly supporters come out sure yeah and Adam, I'll move to you. It seems like, as David mentioned, you know, once a tax goes into effect, it never, even though they say it'll only last to 10 <laughs> well, years, it never goes away. Well, and you'll see this covering districts all the time and covering bond issues, it becomes a cycle. Because, right, you're carrying like 10 or 12 mils bond debt, and then if you don't get a bond issue passed when that comes off, then all of a sudden everyone's taxes go down and they go down a nice chunk. And then it's a lot harder to sell a bond issue and say, well, we're gonna raise your taxes by 18 mils, which is a significant amount for folks versus, oh, well, we can wrap it in and the debt's expiring. And so it's just gonna stay the same and you're gonna get some new schools or updated facilities. So yeah, you usually see it when debt's coming off. And I, I don't know a whole lot about Wichita, but I wonder if they're getting to where their bond debt is about to come off. Yeah, yep. all right, good discussion. We'll move on. Despite the recent uproar, Wichita City Councilman Brandon Johnson says the plan to charge for downtown parking is not going anywhere. However, as Cake's Leon Purvis reports, how the city will go about it that's still up in the air. We're still on track for implementation in January. City Council member Brandon Johnson is making it clear they're on track for some type of paid parking next year. What they're currently having public meetings about is how they're going to do it. Trying to see what the public has an appetite for. Uh, we continue to talk about 75 cents in most spaces. The majority of people that I've talked to think 75 cents is a drop in the bucket. The main areas where you could potentially pay for parking would be Delano, downtown, and Old Town. But some business owners aren't happy about the idea. On Friday and Saturday night, I probably have approximately 30 employees working here on a busy night. Where are they going to park? They're going to pay. They're going to be here for five hours, even if it's 75. Uh, cents per hour. Johnson says they are considering free parking potentially at night and on weekends. We could have free Sundays. We could have free after six o'clock. There could be events like the uh, farmer's market that has free parking. While other business owners think it's not going to benefit anyone. Well, it's a it's a hit. You know, we're in retail and you know, it's not always the money, but it is somewhat about the money because of the sliding scale of charges. Johnson says there is already some paid parking in place. Everyone's paying for parking right now. It may seem free, so if you're going into Old Town, those businesses are paying for parking. I signed my lease, it is included in there for parking. What I pay for my rent, it's parking also. Brian Fry, former city council member, I'll bet you know a little bit about this topic. Absolutely. This, this has actually been discussed for at least four or five years oh, in the council. Much longer. Um, when I first was elected back in 2015, one of the first questions I asked city manager Layton was, when are we going to upgrade our parking meters? 
uh, and they still haven't. Um, they're still just coin fed. And you go to every other metropolitan city and they've got app based or credit card and it makes it impossible to manage a parking fund when you don't have the technology that would allow you to collect the money. Uh, currently, Wichita averages about $300 per space in revenue, um, but they need about five to 600 to be able to maintain and upkeep and provide the necessary safety improvements for parking, lighting, better sidewalks, uh, striping, pothole repair, and the parking fund doesn't have it. Um, there is no such thing as free parking. Yeah. As you're paying for it either with a meter or your property taxes or what you're paying at that retail or restaurant. Yeah. And that, that gets passed along. So how do you do that without it touching the general fund dollars, which the general fund dollars pay for all the streets, police, fire, all the other things that you expect out of your city government. So the downtown parking has to have some type of fund to be able to meet the demand. And as we've seen over the last 10, 15 years, downtown has gotten a lot better. Uh, Mayor Carl Brewer really pushed forward Project Downtown and made investment happen in downtown. And so you're seeing restaurants and retail in Trust Bank Arena. There's more people coming downtown. There's about 13,000 public and private parking spaces, but they're underutilized but there's not enough money to pay for it. And so that's why this is a conversation that's been happening for a long time and needs to happen. I think the city, Olitha, could have handled this discussion better as soon as uh, <laughs> announcing it on social media. It seems like there was a huge firestorm and vastly <laughs> against this paid parking plan. Even though former council member Fry mentioned, people, we are paying for parking already. So I've been watching it on the news and I've been traveling quite lately. Uh, I just left Louisville, Kentucky, and I walked around their downtown area to go visit the Muhammad Ali Museum. And so, but our city here in Wichita, downtown, we're not as big like that. You don't see people just moving about on a constant basis. And so my concern is this, and then I have a, a suggestion for the sure. city um, is, is, so, you know, I just passed the revoke driver's license bill. And that bill will go into effect, into effect on, on January 1st, 2025. So, and it was, it came about from a young man who worked at a steel company downtown Wichita. And so he had to pay for parking and he had to run in and out from his job and he would get all these tickets and then his driver's licenses were, were revoked. So the city and those businesses, perhaps they need to go into some type of an agreement where, where the city gives those employees some kind of pass to put on their windshields. Um, uh, again, you know, we need, you know, the uh, uh, former city councilman Brian Fry said, you know, we have growth in downtown Wichita. However, we need more to bring the people down there to be able to pay for that parking right now. I'm glad that the city has put it on hold for yeah. a while. And it does seem to be on hold. Adam Strunk, I'll move to you. Well, council member Fry talked a little bit about supply and demand. Yeah. 35, and even when I was on the council, I think I remember a study that showed 35%, only 35% of the downtown parking in Wichita mm -hmm. is used, is utilized sure. at any given point. Sure. That doesn't seem to support charging for parking if you've got more than half of the spaces empty at any given one, one point. Well, and I mean, that's development models with all of these cities. Like every time you have an old building show up and then it gets torn down and then we're gonna pave over <laughs> parking lot. And I mean, gosh, some of these cities, Newton, like half our downtown is a parking lot. And then it's like, well, now we have to pay to upkeep all the parking lots from all the buildings we bulldoze instead of trying to redevelop develop it and so yeah like I get why all of this stuff is coming up but I want to hit it from a from a consumer perspective right so like I, you live in Wichita you pay your property taxes you pay your sales taxes you pay your city bills and you are used to going downtown Wichita using mm -hmm. one of the many empty parking spots and parking there for free now you're being told well you need to pay for parking and otherwise it goes on your property tax well you're paying money to the city anyway and those business owners they pay a higher property tax rate than a regular house does they probably feel that look I'm paying all this extra property tax in the city to have these spots. And then the other question I had was how much is going to this out of state company to then 
oversee this parking system. It was like, well, we have to have these fees to fund this company to then collect the fees. Where like for me, like if you want to upgrade your meter parking, great. I'll throw a dollar in, I'll throw some quarters in. What I don't like, because I go to a lot of cities and you got to get a separate app in every single city. Yes. And then you have 47 apps on your phone. And then, oh, guess what? Your data has been stolen again. Uh -huh. And so then you're dealing with another thing. So then like it's just not a great consumer experience. Yeah. Councilman Verfry, I'm going to move back to you. Any yeah. rebuttal to No, and Adams? again, I think what we're really talking about is premium pricing. Yeah. Right? And being able to park door side. Sure. Whether you're a worker or a customer or, you know, a business yeah. employee. Right? Yeah. Everybody in Wichita wants to park right outside their door. You have to walk right? otherwise. And, and right. And yeah. nobody wants to no walk. No one wants to right? walk. And so when you look at the overlay of downtown in this area, about 60% of it is surface lots or sure. garages. There's a lot of parking available but everybody wants to park right out front. Mm -hmm. And so should that parking space that's free out front, should an employee at a restaurant take it versus that spot being eligible for turnover, maybe three mm -hmm. or four times in that evening that that employee is there, that generates more revenue for that restaurant because now that, um, that yeah. customer is right outside and can maybe be three or four table turns. And so mm -hmm. that's the balance that you have yeah. to find. And I think what happened is they put too much on the table at once. Mm -hmm. This parking yeah. plan and study started in 2017. It was going along through 2019, COVID hit, it stopped, and no one was driving, no one was parking. <laughs> and then it's back, uh, and because you've got 3,000 students gonna be coming downtown with the biomed. And so that premium parking is gonna be even more in demand. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? And that's where that elasticity has to be figured out. All right. Well, I think maybe that's the message or the information that the public needs. Yeah, because that's because not the right now that they don't. Out, right? Yeah, because it was like all of a sudden all of Wichita's parking is going to be charged, and then I was reading <laughs> stuff and I don't like about surge price, like yes, all kinds of right. stuff. Where it's like this sounds like a terrible experience. I think they yeah. threw everything out there yeah. to see what is going to that threshold of pain. You know yeah. how much you're going to be willing to do. I think you have to start with the meters on the primary streets, Douglas you know, Maine, Broadway, yeah. et cetera, and then work out from there. And then it's trying to figure out how to take some of these empty lots and repurpose them. It's crazy that land for housing is expensive, but land for parking is free. And we got to figure out how to create more development activity for housing and, you know, other purposes Brian, and, and business development. I, I think Councilman Johnson said that, you know, maybe we could have Sundays free, evenings free, but it's already free, yeah. isn't yeah, it? Right. Yeah. It is currently like free that way and, right And now. the usage is much lower on the right. weekends too. It sounds yeah. like they are, they're just sort of throwing things out and they're be changing it in midstream and people are not gonna like that. Yeah. You're already getting it free and then, I wouldn't wanna be on the city commission. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But like council member Fry said, it's not technically free. Someone's <laughs> gotta pay for it. We'll leave that discussion there and move on though. Good discussion though, it will continue to go. The Kansas Bureau of Investigation has now positively identified the body found in a crashed pickup truck in Harvey County to be that of interim Peabody City Clerk Jonathan Clayton. Clayton had been missing for several weeks. He's been implicated in several crimes. The, dis this di the, excuse me, the disappearance of $1.5 million in city funds, as well as missing money at previous cities where he had worked. Adam has been closely covering this story. And Adam, get us up to date on this. We'll start with you since you're from well, the Newton Harvey yeah, County area. Sure, I think the point of clarity here is the what he's being investigated right now is for missing funds in Mullenville. Uh, Peabody, the grants he were in, we've talked to Peabody police chief, we've talked to the Peabody mayor multiple times. They said it like the last week at least, unless things have changed, he was not being investigated for any missing funds within Peabody. Um, this has just been one of those stories that's spiraled and spiraled yeah. and spiraled. And I'll try to be as concise as I can on this. But um, basically, guy goes missing August 3rd. No one finds him. A missing person's case goes out. And um, all of a sudden, then everybody's looking for him. More and more information comes to light. And then five days after he's missing, this email goes out. This email goes out to a lot of major news stations. It goes out to government agencies. It goes out to people we know, basically saying, like, if you're reading this, I am incapacitated or I've passed. Um, this is kind of what was going on, where he argued against some of the investigation that was going on to him from the state, but he also implicated a number of legislative leaders, including um, Lieutenant Governor David Toland, basically that he was forced to change the scores on grants, like during COVID grants, um, to make sure that certain projects that were agreed on by legislative leaders got this funding. Now, that was kind of out in the kind of space for about two weeks 
finally it's gotten a little more coverage to where the Department of Commerce has actually spoke on right. it. They put out a release yesterday unequivocally denying it. Um, and then thir later in the day, the governor's office put out a speech. It wasn't the governor, it was uh, her chief of staff. They asked the information to be attributed to, saying basically like, look, like we support David Tolan and we're having this third party investigation, but this was already going on two weeks ago. So some of us working the case or, or story are just like, well, why didn't you just say that two weeks ago right. when we were asking questions? So like, I, I, I don't know where this goes from here. Yeah. Because like, one, like it's a tragedy that this person it's passed away. Tragic. It's absolutely mm -hmm. terrible. Wow. Two, you've got all of this stuff going on. And three, like, what do you do with the Department of Commerce information? Because like, they're in a spot here where best case scenario is it comes out that they hired someone who they probably shouldn't have hired and then some funds were sent where they shouldn't have been f sent. Right. Worst case scenario is that there were various politicians having backroom dealings to steer huge amounts of money to their districts. And then there's a scenario where both of those things are true. Um, and so I don't know if this kind of dies off. I don't know if this spins up in the next legislative session, but the deal is bipartisan. So I don't know if who's <laughs> going to bring it up yeah. because you might not gain points. Um, so there's just, there's a lot of questions there yeah. and it's a yeah. strange story. So I have a question for you sure. because I, I just saw this story as I was leaving the house today for the show and I saw uh, Lieutenant Governor David Toland's yeah. face on the television and then the, the president of the yeah. Senate's face on yeah. there. So what is their connection? Well, basically it goes back to SPARC. And I, 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 we talk about acronyms before the show started. And now I do not have the SPARC acronym off the top of my head. But basically, COVID pandemic, relief funds. Yeah, we got a huge there amount of COVID relief funds. And then there was a select group. I think it was uh, Tolan, maybe it was, it was Reichman. It was, uh, Reichman. Uh, Reichman and Ty Masterson. Ty Masterson. And they all said, that we're going to meet in the select group and decide how these are going to be distributed. Then they created this base grant system, which was supposed to send grants to different projects in Kansas for economic development. But didn't they travel around the state and do that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so they were going to put all this money out towards economic development. And that's kind of why they are getting tied in was he okay. was saying, cause he was, he was like a director and overseeing how these grants were distributed. He was saying that he was made to alter the some scoring. of the scoring for pre oh, pre approved oh. stuff, which again, like all, all empathy aside, like as a reporter, like he's not a reliable source because you have all of this back history, but just because he's not a reliable source doesn't mean that it it's not true. Could, and again, yeah, like right. it was such a strange email. And it's like, if that's going to be the last thing you send out, why, yeah. why you make mm -hmm. that very specific claim? And like, there were a lot of newspapers and other media outlets during the time when almost half of those first grant funds went to Johnson and Butler County that asked a lot of questions and right. said, cried foul. And, right. and now one thing that you could work on when you get back to Topeka, <laughs> apparently is about 30 he, seconds, he, David. He, he had a criminal back, a financial crime. Right. He was convicted of fi financial yeah. crime in, in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania. But the Department of Commerce hired him to oversee these grants because they are forbidden from doing a criminal right. background yeah, check. Right. They can't do it by law. And the statement that the, that the state yeah, issued today that explains that. That said, by law, we could not do a national background check. So no, they probably could have gone on online and done a search. Or some for the county. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but but, but yeah, that, that so could change. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm sure that will then change. Then the last point is the wildest part is if that truck wouldn't have been wrecked down kind of in the ravine off of the road, if it would have been within you know distance i drove by it five times when we were writing this those yeah. stories like all of a sudden this is a 300 word fatality accident maybe a little small right. feature a bit in the local paper and then nothing move on all right and i'm sure that story will garner a lot more attention in the next few weeks as well our last story today the cdc says kansas is one of the nation's hot spots right now for covid 19 and the push is on to get all of us at the latest vaccine again cakes jocelyn schifferdecker has the details on that we may not be wearing masks anymore but covid 19 is still active in kansas this map from the CDC says as of August 22nd, the state's viral activity level is very high. That's why experts are pushing for people to get the new COVID-19 vaccine in addition to their flu shot. Getting, the, say, the flu vaccine um, lowers your chance of getting the flu later on, but it also, if you happen to get the flu, gives your body a head start so that the symptoms are going to be less severe. The new vaccine will be developed every year to battle current COVID variants, kind of like how a flu shot works. It is now available at several pharmacies, including any Dillon store. We're here in Dillon's getting the new COVID-19 vaccine, which is now recommended seasonally. 
With September just around the corner, experts say the earlier you can get it, the better. It's hot out, we're not thinking about it, but it takes about two weeks for your immune system to build that immunity after you get the vaccine. So now is the time to come in. Flu shots are recommended for all ages. The COVID-19 vaccine is recommended for everyone six years and older. Pharmacist Mike Ryan says most insurances cover the cost. It takes less than 15 minutes and you only feel a slight pinch. Did it, did it happen already? Yeah. I didn't feel anything. <laughs> Put that on there. Ryan says last year there were over 300,000 people hospitalized from the flu. He is urging people to get their COVID and flu shots now. You not only protect yourself, but you protect um, your loved ones and your community. Boom. I'm ready for the season. <laughs> In Northeast Wichita, Jocelyn Schifferdecker, Cake News on your side. Well, David Seaton, I guess that's a positive endorsement for the vaccine. It, it, it seems though, here we go again. The good news is we're not seeing hospitalizations. So because of that, do you think we'll be able to convince people to continue getting the vaccine? Uh, I don't think a lot of people are going to get the vaccine. I was looking some, at some numbers. Um, during the height of the pandemic, when the vaccine came out, I think it was about 65% of the Kansas population got vaccinated. And then the last cycle, uh, 2022, 2023, it was down to about 11%. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think there's uh, some fatigue with it. There's mm -hmm. uh, vaccine hesitancy. So the public health officials and uh, people who care about this are really going to have to do a, a, a big job of, of telling people to get it. Um, I think that uh, the, we, our flu vaccine rates aren't very high either here in right. Kansas. They're less than 30%. So I don't know. Adam Strunk, anything to add? No, I mean, you, you hit the right thing, and I always think that's something we need to look on as journalists is the outcomes. You know what I mean? Like, COVID rates are exploding. Okay, what does that mean on the outcomes? Is our healthcare system stressed? Or are we having mortalities? That kind of thing. So if people aren't seeing that kind of damage, I mean, to me, I think it's going to turn into, like, you get a flu shot every year, you yeah. get your vaccine every year. I, if I get a, a booster, it's going to be because I went to get my flu shot. So right. I just don't think that there's the kind of fear and issues, and we've seen it get kind of milder over time. Yeah, yeah I think Kansas have a healthy dose of skepticism on this. Yeah, I, I, and, and Council Member Fry, you dealt with the mask discussion oh yeah, during yep, the, during your yep, time on the council. Yep. Oh my God. Yeah, I'm not surprised by those numbers. And this is the first story I've heard about the the resurgence. So yeah, I think there's a lot of hesitation, a lot of skepticism, and you'll see. Yeah. Even there is a, a much higher percentage of people who take it. Uh, older folks. Fifteen seconds. Yeah. yeah. Older folks who might be more susceptible to yeah. to. Uh, uh, health issues if they got COVID, COVID yeah. yeah. All right, well, we'll make that the last word because we are out of time this week. Once again, I want to thank our guests, Harvey County Now Managing Editor Adam Strunk, Cowley Courier Traveler Publisher and Editor David Seaton, State Senator Olitha faust Gudo, and former Wichita City Council Member Brian Fry. We also want to thank Cake and KSN for sharing their stories with us. If you have any questions, email us at kansasweek at kpts.org. Have a great day. I'm Jared Sorello.